You have approximately 30 seconds to get in your seats, get your books out, and let's roll. <laughs> How'd you like the teacher voice there? Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, I can get the... I'm messing with you, Rosa. <clears throat> Definitely not going to mess with Papa there. How we doing today? I know, I'm messing with you. Um, Y'all, this whole month... Um, There you go. Uh, actually, the whole th next three months, uh, all the lessons are on faith. Wow. So um, in the front of your, your text, it goes through, because, um, you know, generally leading up to Christmas, we'll have the this Christmas story, but not this time. So it's interesting. Um, and then actually, um, on Christmas Eve, you, you, we'll do Mary and Mary's, you know, story. And then after Christmas, the faith of the wise men. So that's kind of neat. Good morning, Ms. Capistock. Then we've got, um, in January, you see all the different faith and uh, whatever uh, noun that it goes with, righteousness, trust, encouragement, transformation. And then um, faith in the different things that are going on, um, you know, in times of trial. Or looks like we're going to uh, Daniel in the fiery furnace and all of those different things. But uh, let's kick it off today in December with, uh, with um, Ruth. All right, so um, what, do you, what would you like to pray about before we get started? And uh, this, this lesson today is so much fun. Anytime we do the sovereignty of God, um, you guys, yeah, go ahead and turn to page three. Anytime you do the sovereignty of God, it is uh, always fun. Anytime you do Ruth or Esther or uh, anything where it just shows God behind the scenes the entire time is fun. Mm -hmm. Good morning. So what can we pray about? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Margie's back. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to go to Miss Shirley then. Are, are you good? Is it reflecting? <laughs> Was it shining the spotlight in your... <laughs> ah, way to take care of things. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Because there's a lot of uh, COVID and viruses and strep throat is going around. RSV, um, a young couple that uh, when they come sit over here uh, called and um, uh, the young man's name is Nick and her name is Bridget. And um, they've taken her to Florence. She's got RSV. So let's pray for them. They're young, in their 30s, and uh, they've been coming, you know, off and on. And um, you hear a little, you know, fleshly attack on the, the body. Let's pray for Bridget uh, as she's over in Florence. And uh, when I left, Preach was on the phone with uh, the husband, with Nick. So we'll see what's going on there. So we'll pray for them. Yes, ma'am. You are going to say, Gail. Um, mm -hmm. Sage. Sage, how we doing, chick? Struggling, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. She's she's uh, the, uh, hidden. <laughs> she's in obscurity, but uh, little Asher's just uh, taking his sweet time. Mhm. Mm oh, okay. So you're not off too much there, Sage. Yes, big life change ahead of you, baby. Yes, lots of prayers for that. Okay, what else? Okay. Yes. 
Judy Foley, Frank Davis, um, Eloise's husband, William. Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We'll see how that turns out. Um, I would uh, ask for prayer for my brother. He was supposed to have a heart catheter. I think I'd ask for that last week. But uh, his Humana insurance will not cover it at this point. So we're praying that the insurance people will find favor um, with his case. So that uh, they rescheduled it for the 12th. So if you'll pray for uh, insurance coverage, I'd appreciate it. Anything else? Anything else? You and your family. Is Melinda, uh, Melinda, Melanie and Darnell going to get to come home for Christmas? I hope so. Oh, okay. Right, yeah, if she can have get the time off this quick, yeah. Oh, I hope so. I would love to see them. I want to see, the, see those kids, you know? Gosh. Okay, anybody else? Um, he's been playing golf, so he must be okay. <laughs> Kirk Hamilton. Yeah, he's, he's be, he must be doing okay because um, he'll still play golf with uh, the preacher when he feels like it, you know what I'm saying? So he must be doing okay. Yep, yep, yep. Anybody else? Anything else? Appreciate your prayers from last week. Uh, you know, um, that uh, stomach bug hit uh, our house with, uh, you know, Solomon wasn't here last Sunday, and then, then I had the privilege of uh, entertaining that bug, and then it hit Elijah. And uh, bless the Lord with uh, the preacher and Molly, it was a mild case. Yay. So uh, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. That's what I keep telling um, my students at school. Mm -hmm. We've had really good weather the last couple of days. Mm. All right, let's pray then. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for the day. and We thank you for the opportunity again to be here. Thank you for getting us up today and helping us to um, be able to be here. You've given us breath. You've given us life. And with that, you give us uh, hope, Lord. And uh, we all need hope, and we thank you for that. And Lord, there's, there's things that we hope for. There's things that our faith hopes for. And we thank you for all the things that um, you've given us, the blessings. I thank you for the uh, Thanksgiving time last uh, week and the Christmas that's coming, Lord, and all these days of celebration of different holidays, the birth of your Son, the time that you give us off with family and friends. I thank you for Christmas decorations and lights and trees and just the beauty that this time gives us, Lord. We thank you for that. We thank you for the brownness of the earth and all the leaves that are not on the trees. We thank you for the beauty of this season of winter, Lord. We just want to tell you how much we love you and how much we enjoy the the changes that you bring about, even though sometimes they're hard, Lord, we thank you for the changes you bring in our lives. We thank you for the faith that you've given us. We thank you for the salvation you've given us through Jesus, your Son. And we just bless your name, Lord. Everything that's in us, we just bless you, Lord. We come before you with all of these prayer requests for all the people that are struggling with different situations we lift them up before you, Lord, and we just ask you to go before them and then be their rear guard. Take care of tests, Lord, MRIs and heart caths and all these different um, cancer treatments and 
the treatments for RSV, Lord, and all the things that you're doing. Thank you for nurses and doctors. Help us, Lord, as we're family and we support our family and support each other and the things that we go through. Help hurting backs, Lord, and help children, Lord, that are sick and young people that are going through with uh, strep throats and all the different things. We thank you, Father, for the time you give us to uh, let our bodies heal. And we thank you for the miracle of our bodies, that they do heal. And Lord, we thank you for the the great plans that you have in our lives as we're going to study in your servant Ruth today, Lord. I just thank you for the story that this is and the hope that it gives us and the faith that it brings. We pray that you're with the upcoming message, the song, teachers, Lord, and those who work with the children. We ask you to bless them in a special way, God. We want to tell you how much we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. And while I was praying that, I thought of the Sprite last night. Oh, that was so cool, wasn't it, Shirley? I just appreciated those kids. Mm. Shirley's granddaughter uh, played a part in a school play that we watched last night. And uh, I'd have never thought that kid would do that. That was so cool. Oh. She had that sass, didn't she? <laughs> oh, did you go to all the parades? They were fun, weren't they? You got a ladder Friday? Yeah. Late views yesterday? Uh huh. Oh, yeah. Santa, yes. Ah. Oh. Well, guys, uh, we're just doing the first chapter of Ruth, which makes me sad. I know. Um, But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. So um, I know that we're supposed to do uh, 6 through 18 and then 22, and y'all know that that's not the case. We're going to start with verse (laughs) 1. It came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. What do y'all know about the judges, the time of the judges? Didn't have a king. It was the time of the judges in the land. The uh, people of Israel, of course, had come into the promised land. And uh, this to some time had pl- passed since, you know, Joshua and these guys have died off. And you don't have real leadership, but you have people that God calls to rise up called judges. And I, actually, the, the book right in front of, you know, Ruth um, is Judges. And there's all kinds of great stories in Judges. And some of them are tough. Some of them are hard to understand about, you know, why God would let this happen or why God would let that happen. But nonetheless, it's good because a lot of times in our lives, we ask, God, why did you let that happen? Or why is this person in charge? Or why is that person uh, over here? And what's happening over here? So um, as the the time of the judges is rolling on, uh, eventually you're going to get a really great judge named Samuel in the next book. And uh, the time of the judges will come to an end because there will be a king anointed, King Saul. Yes, sir. And the answer is yes. (laughs) All of this is God's sovereignty. Every inch of it. Every inch of this is God's sovereignty. Now, do people make poor choices in the midst of your everyday lives or in the midst of your life? Everybody shake your head, yes. We all make a a poor choice. We all can, you know, um, decide to do something that's contrary to God's word. But then uh, what did uh, God say through Joseph in Genesis 50? He was talking to his brothers. You guys meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. So he'll take all of our stupidness and turn it into good. It's amazing how he can do that, right? In the midst of the chastisement now. In the midst of the chastisement. So absolutely, uh, anything that happens on the planet Earth, God has um, uh, caused or allowed, right? Caused or allowed. And it says that it was the time of the judges and they ruled... So it was a time of political instability. You didn't really have government that's going to try to assist and do things. 
um, that there was a famine in the land. So we know that that famine is uh, going to cause people to make some choices that they need to make. Um, you're either going to have to uh, you know, go into your storehouses of hopefully things that... We've all got savings accounts, right? Eh, yeah. <clears throat> sometimes mine looks okay and sometimes it's decimated. And I have to start all over. Stays at two bucks. There you go. You got two bucks. That's right. Thank you, Lord. So um, this, the closing days of the judges, this is at the very end. It's about a 400-year time period, y'all. The judges went on for a, pe- um, a pretty good uh, time. And uh, they were not ruled by the kings, but by these people that I just you know, mentioned that God had raised up. And some of your major judges were Gideon. He's one of my faves. Uh, Samson, he's another favorite that, bless his heart, didn't turn out so good for him. But uh, God used him. And then Deborah and Barak. Yeah, that's another great story. But um, this, uh, you know, they, they pretty much led Israel through a challenge that Israel would have, and then they would just kind of sink back into obscurity again. And somebody else would rise up. So um, they were pretty dark days. And to make things a little worse, um, then a famine comes. So... Um, Let's see what happens to a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. And this is telling you the city and the province that they're living in, in Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. Now, that's uh, a foreign country. It's pagan. And um, more than likely, he probably shouldn't have gone there. But at the same time, you know, this was uh, directed and the, the, the direction that he went, he and his wife and his two sons. Gives you some background on the kids. And um, there's, um, with the famine and what propelled him to go there, you know, God specifically tells us that there will be trouble, but he says also in Psalm 34 that he will, uh, you know, that many are the troubles of the righteous, but he will deliver them out of them all. I like that word all. Not out of one or two things, but he'll deliver us out of all. <clears throat> so um, there was... <laughs> If Elimelech would have stayed where he was, there would have been a deliverance. Because we see whenever Naomi hears about uh, the land of Judah doing better, it's ten years later. Now y'all know, and I teach this in economics, that every seven to ten years, there's a natural wave, good economic uh, situation, good boom, good boom, and then like any wave, what does it do? It'll crash. So you'll have every seven to ten years, if you go back and look at a graph, and I show this to the kids, uh, in our country, you'll see the waves. You will. You'll see the the economic waves. Um, Even with the Great Depression, major crash. All the way down to that bottom zero line on the X, Y axis. (laughs) So whenever this happens, so think about it. In ten years, the wave was rising back up. So I just, I just want to throw that out you out there at you because that's an economic principle. Yes. Yeah. Ups and downs. <laughs> that's the way it rolls. So it says they went to sojourn. And they went to dwell in the country of Moab. Now, sojourn means you're going to go with the intent of coming back. To sojourn. Right? Do you know what we're called here on the planet Earth? Sojourners. Yes with the intent of going back to where we actually belong, is with the Lord. Yeah, this is not our home. There you go. Awesome. You could, you could sit and preach on that thing right there for a while. That's fun. They went to sojourn. <laughs> the name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. The name of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. So this is where they're from. They're from the top tribe of Ephraim. <laughs> I couldn't pull that out. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Now, while they're there, there's some tragedy that's going to happen in their lives. Um, Of course, um, when they went to Moab, they didn't find life easier. You know how we do. We think the grass is greener on the other side. Not always. So when it got there, life actually turned into a mess for the entire family. Bless their hearts. Now, it could have gone the other way, but it did not. Again, God's sovereignty, His direction... And uh, sometimes I'm sure for them, 
they couldn't dis always discern why things were going south for them, but I'll bet you they probably thought we're being punished for leaving Bethlehem, for leaving our people and coming to live in a pagan country. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. Now, during this 10-year time period, apparently, as Malon and Kilion were growing up, they took wives from the Moabite women. Now, what is the protocol in God's Old Testament word for marriage among the Israelites? You don't marry outside of the Jewish people. Why? He's trying to keep the religious views intact. Now, that's not so for us today, except it is. You don't marry outside of your salvation, right? You marry a believer. I mean, the Scripture is very, very uh, intent on that in the New Testament. It doesn't care about race. It's the religious thing, like it was with the Jewish people. It's the religious thing, and the other foreigners were ones who worshipped pagan gods. In fact, uh, the Moabites worshipped uh, Molech, and that was that statue that um, uh, it would be hollow on the inside, and they would put wood and everything in the, in the bottom part underneath it, uh, and turn, you know, keep, keep putting wood in until that thing got red hot. And they would sacrifice their children on the arms of an out. It would be like, you know, like that. And they'd put the child into the arms of that red hot, um, I'm sure it was iron statue, which I can't even imagine. I don't even want to go there. <clears throat> so anyway, these were, this is the, this is the type of culture that they were living in. Very pagan, um, you know, the very superstitious, worshiping idols giving offerings to that, and then, of course, sacrificing of children. And this is what Ruth and uh, the other chick that uh, Malon had married, um, was uh, Kilion married, was Orpah. So you've got uh, these two women who were, of course, from this culture, and you understand when we, you know, our values, our beliefs, the culture that we grow up in is huge, has a huge impact on who you are, who your personality is, and we need to, you know, when you think about marrying somebody, um, they need to, first of all, need to be a believer. And second of all, you know, you need to have some stuff in common, <laughs> right? With, uh, you know, your, your, um, your thought processes and all that. Because y'all think about it, because once you start having children, uh, your values and your beliefs that you start teaching your kids can sometimes, uh, you know, butt heads. So there has to be a lot of things, you know. So it's just a, something that um, these guys married pagan women. That's it. How can two walk together? Absolutely. Mm -mm. Amen. <laughs> but, but mama... I know I can change him. I heard that, Netta. <laughs> Only God can change people. That's the truth. And it's still going to be a hog. That's right. So as time goes on, about 10 years, you know, the, the, the husband dies, the two boys die, and now, now, now you've got three childless widows. And in those days, women were... No rights, no rights. Couldn't even get a job, you know, nothing. Uh, in that day, you, there was you know, the strict protocol that the women were you know, doing the children, living in the home, and this was what uh, the expectation was. So how are these women going to live? Well, off the generosity of a family, right? And uh, so let's see what happens. Uh, you had to live, you know, to, you had to eat. You needed somewhere to live, and you had to, of course, pay for where you're living. You have to pay for food. So if there's nothing coming in, there's uh, some choices that these women had to make. And you understand, you know, that um, you can't live off the generosity of uh, strangers but for so long because people will quit giving. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's our human nature. It's, it's, we expect other things. 
So uh, Naomi didn't have any family in Moab, and, and um, there was, it was a very d- uh, desperate situation. In verse 6, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. You hear me? So there's a, and it had been about 10 years. So that's the good news about that is uh, there had been uh, a recovery, there had been an economic recovery, and uh, she's going to head back to uh, home. So uh, when she did this, <clears throat> she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. Now, the customs of that day, you know, those girls had married into that family, and uh, you generally did not go back home to your daddy and your mama. You did not. So um, she had to, those girls had to decide what they were going to do, and they were, you know, going to go with uh, Naomi. And there's all kinds of things we could speculate, but let's see what was going on. Naomi wants to get back home. She wants to be part of the good things that God's doing. She's sick and tired of being sick and tired. Ten years of it. Ten years of it. She's lost everything. She's lost her mate. She's lost her children. The girl has absolutely nothing. The fact that um, uh, even reading this, Gail, I so thought of you. (laughs) With uh, the, the husband passing away, two boys passing away. Oh, my heart, it it just breaks. But she's thinking, I want to go home. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She just doesn't know that yet, though. She don't know that, though. If, If we can walk in where she is right now, she has no concept as she's walking through it. That's what makes this whole lesson so much fun. Because we can see and we can walk in her shoes with her. And we can understand that she has lost everything, but she doesn't know what God's up to. So you think about where you're sitting right now. You have no idea the great plan that God's up to in your life and in the lives of your family and what He's getting ready to do. That's what's so cool. I mean, you know, He's... It blows my mind that He has good things... And, and, and he's working in the lives of, and I know there's not kajillion people on the planet, <laughs> but in the lives of kajillion, I just made that kajillion up, um, of all the past people on the planet. And he's, he worked out every, every detail in the lives of every person on the planet Earth, even in the unjust, even in the unjust, because he's always drawing people to himself. That's amazing to me. But in the lives of his children, how he's constantly working good for us, good for us, in spite of the fact that we chose to go to Moab. How many of y'all have chosen to go to Moab? I've, I've chosen Moab a bunch, a bunch. And it always ended in <laughs> disaster. So um, this, just, this just sets her apart here. So our life with God... When you look at what uh, Ruth and and Orpah are going to do, our life with God ought to make people want to go with us. And that's a big question. Does our life with God make people, do we draw people to us? Do we draw others to us because of who He is within us? Greater is He that's within me than he that's in the world, right? So she went out from the place and her daughter-in-laws are with her and they're on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to the two girls, Go, return each to your mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. Y'all been faithful, girls. Y'all been good. Now that doesn't mean that they probably didn't have their struggles and arguments and disagreements, right? But the Lord deal kindly with you. You've dealt with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest. Oh, that thing is so packed right there. Each in the house of her husband. That, you know, you're young enough, y'all can go get remarried. But she was blessing them. She prayed they would remarry. She said each in the house of her husband. So she was praying that. She was putting a blessing over their lives. And uh, and also, if you'll go and look what, what she says here, that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. 
She was connecting, finding rest. Now, some of y'all may not like this. <laughs> finding rest in their marriages. Do you find rest in your marriage? And I had to ask myself that. <laughs> Miss Karen, what you got to say? Absolutely, yeah. And, and she's saying, you know, if, if... Exactly. Uh, there's no son to take care of you. Because in that day, and y'all, it's still like this over in Asia. The son takes care of his mom and daddy. When the woman marries a guy in, it doesn't matter if it's Vietnam, China, Japan, this is an Asian culture thing, that um, the son's wife's going to take care of... His mom, uh, her husband's mom and daddy. That would be me taking care of y'all. Y'all go ahead and move in. I got you. You want to wait till Solomon and Elijah get a little older? <laughs> ah. No, I'll be putting Margie in the kitchen. What? What? If they had you, oh, absolutely. I would think that they would. They would probably more than likely be taking care of Naomi, and you wouldn't have this. You wouldn't have this whole story. I don't think. So did, did, did God direct those, those men to pass away during those ten years? I believe yes. Because He had a greater plan in mind, but He used those three men in the life of Naomi to bring her pleasure, to bring her joy. Those were her kids. That was her husband. She loved them intensely. And then, but there was another plan. And those men played a big part in what God had to do for them. Right. You walk through that circumstance right then. At, at that moment. She had no idea of what was in, in the future. Just like we don't. This, this thing... Yeah, it gives you such hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't look at the future. Oh, no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. <laughs> when she said, The Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband... God intends that marriage, that marriage be a place of rest, a source of solitude, a place where people can um, exemplify the Lord in their marriages, in their homes. And I thought that was beautiful, fine rest. I just wanted to bring that out to you. So uh, she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And this shows you they had a real relationship. I think these women loved each other. Now you think about it. It is gorgeous. I believe that they helped each other through these difficult times in their lives. When the loss of these, and, and the death, and you know, this happened, and then not too long after that, then this happened. And if you're like that, and your you know, parents died you know, close together, or children died close together, husband, I mean the whole thing, Gail, that you've been through, it's just a beautiful picture of the faith of this woman. And what a, a, an incredible woman Naomi is. We always focus on Ruth, but look at Naomi. They did. I believe they did. So much so that one of them's going to go, one of them's going to uh, stay. And they said, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Now, the culture of that day. Uh, dictated that um, the brothers of a, um, of a dead uh, husband, that the brothers would go in, be intimate with that widow, so that they could keep the line of that family name going on. That's interesting to even think about. Like, oh, wow. Larry, Ken... Tommy, you got a choice. <laughs> ah, whew. So that's what I'm saying. That's weird to us. But that was the culture of the day. It was just, you know, one of those social norms. And she said, you know, uh, turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they can grow up to be your husbands and then y'all have children? So it's an impossibility here. She's saying, no, turn back. I'm too old to have a husband. And I'm thinking, you know, she must have been, I'm thinking, you know, 
in her 60s. I'm just thinking, what? 60s or 70s, right? Had to be an older woman here. Would you wait for them till they're grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much. She's making logical sense here and saying, look, you know, this is not the way you ought to go. This is, this is what you need to be thinking about. Her wisdom, it grieves me for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Look at the attitude that she has. She feels like everything she's done has been wrong. So the Lord took her husband, the Lord took her son, and the Lord took her second son. She feels like she's being punished. When in fact, you and I both know where we're sitting here on this side of you know history, that's not what was going on. That wasn't it at all. But at the same time, you know, that, that would be something. The hand of the Lord is against me. This weighed heavily on her. She was so sad. She felt like she was being disobedient. Shouldn't have left the promised land. Should have stayed in Bethlehem of Judah. And then she shouldn't have allowed her sons to marry these Moabitess women. But we really liked them. They were great girls. But apparently, she and Elimelech were teaching who the God, the Jehovah God of Israel was. Because Ruth knew who he was. And I'll bet you Orpah did too. Orpah just makes a choice. Okay? So we're looking at all of this. She didn't even accuse God of doing uh, wrong against her. She just said the hand of the Lord is against me. She didn't fuss and complain and ask God all these questions that I do. I don't know how y'all do. And uh, she was, uh, if she's bitter or she's angry, um, you know, you think about if she was feeling like that, she might not have wanted to go back to the land of Bethlehem. She might have wanted to go further away from Bethlehem. But no, she wanted to go back to God. She wanted to return. And he was calling her too, buddy. Nobody puts those, uh, when, 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 when you feel those needs, like Melanie having that dream, when, when, you, when he puts that in you, you got to do it. And she wanted to go home. And then, you know, she's, and, and, and more than likely, she probably was feeling that way anyway. Then she gets the news that, hey, things are looking good up in Bethlehem. Girls, we're going home. I'm going home. <clears throat> but what she couldn't see was not that the hand of the Lord was against her. Where does she say that? Oh, I'll turn back to da 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 uh, it's in verse, uh, where am I, 13? The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Uh, au contraire, my friends, the hand of the Lord was for her. <laughs> he was actually working out something really awesome on behalf of her, but on behalf of you and me. You don't know. You live in this age. I was thinking about this when I was going through this this week. I thought of all the reasons why I'm so glad I've been born in this time of history and not in that time, not, you know, and in this country. Look, can I give you all my first reason that came to my mind? Duke's mayonnaise. Duke's mayonnaise. If I'd have been living back in that day, they had not invented Duke's mayonnaise. Come on. Think about all the wonderful things that you have in this point in history. You have central air and heating in your home. Amen. For all of you that's grown up with the wood stove, right here, me too, smelled like a piece of ham. People would go, what's that? It would be me. <laughs> Think about what you've grown up in. And I'm being crazy. I met my mind just, when I did, I thought about Duke's mayonnaise. They didn't have that back then. <laughs> All the crazy stuff. Think about what ha God has plopped you right here in this piece of history to be on the planet Earth to make an influence and persuade your family, your friends, all the people that you have the opportunity to be around and to evangelize for His name. Right now. Not then. He used Naomi, Ruth, and whoever. He's got people in every city. He's taking care of all that stuff. He's plopped you down right here. And I say again, Duke's mayonnaise. Go ahead. There you go. Or walk. 
You can plug them in and they run. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Ah. Oh. We live in a good world. Yes, sir. Well, sure. We have. It's amazing what, what gifts that we have, what blessings that we have. She did not know and have the slightest idea of how greatly God was getting ready to bless her. Now, Robert, I'm, I'm ready to go to the, what, the comments you made, the treasure that God had given her. And she didn't even know what a treasure Ruth was going to turn out to be. And she might have thought, golly, girl, why would you not go back with your, free, you know, with your sister-in-law? Think about the things that were going through her mind. Well, how am I going to take care of her? You know, I'd be thinking that. I'd be thinking, God, girl, I can't hardly feed myself. You know? I'd be thinking all this crazy stuff. So they lifted up their voice and they clung to each other and they, they um, you know, uh, this, all the love that they had and all the love that had been shared between them. But uh, when it says Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, what happened to Orpah? I want to give you the tradition that is said about Orpah. Y'all ready for this one? Rabbinic tradition says that uh, Orpah shed four tears over the thought of parting from her mother-in-law. And the rabbis go on to say that she walked four miles with Naomi and was going to, you know, walk those four miles back to where, whatever city they were in in Moab. And that um, Orpah is the one who gave birth to four sons. One's name was Goliath and then his three brothers. Just throwing that at you. Old rabbinic tradition, that's just what is said. And uh, we eventually know that little old David's going to come through this grandchild that uh, Ruth is going to have and fight against Orpah's son. Is that crazy or what? <laughs> I don't know. There you go. That's... Uh, worth nothing there. So uh, this is what she says. Uh, it's an old rabbinic tradition. So just look up uh, rabbinic tradition of who Orpah was. She said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. That's where, Gail, I'd be thinking, girl, you need to go back with your sister-in-law. I, I can't drag somebody home with me. Plus, think about what uh, Naomi was thinking. Gosh, she's from Moab. She won't be received. You know, think about all the stuff that's going through her head. And here's what Ruth says. And y'all, this is one of the most beautiful pieces. And it's said in weddings all over. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. Now I want you to get the true intent of what Ruth was saying here. She gave up everything. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. I'm turning my back on Moabites. Where you die, I will die. And where you're buried, I will be buried. Do you hear me? She chose to live. She chose to live with Naomi completely. She don't even want to go back home. She never, she knows that once she goes that way, she'll never go home again. She'll never see her mama. She'll never see her daddy. She'll never see nieces and nephews, best friends, completely turning her back on everything that she was. There's a whole message in that, y'all. A complete whole... Mm. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. I'm going to be buried beside you, Naomi. Y'all, that is so huge that she chose to do that. And then um, at this point in time, now the two of them until they came to Bethlehem, and it happened when they come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them, and the women said, is this Naomi? It's been ten years, y'all. Y'all know in ten years we, we change. Your face changes, your body changes, you either lose weight or put on weight. <laughs> you know, uh, everything, you know, eyes change. You ever notice you don't have those big old round eyes you used to have when you were a kid? Right? <laughs> everything droops. Really changes. I mean, your face completely changes. It really does. 
There you go, Mr. Larry. Amen to that. Now, when she said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Look at her confession, y'all. Look at her confession. Naomi means pleasant, lovely. And Mara is a form of Mary, which means bitter, bitterness. In fact, my name is Mary Beth. Beth means praise, because Bethlehem is the house of bread and praise. Mary means bitter, so my name means bitter praise. (laughs) I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Robert, what is she missing? Her treasure. She didn't come back empty. She had a girl beside her that was going to bless her beyond her wildest dreams. I mean, beyond anything. How do you not know that what looks like the worst thing in the world turns out to be the best thing that ever happened to you? (laughs) Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me? Here she is again, his hands against me, and has afflicted me. Now, she was afflicted now, and she was hurting. She had some deep wounds. But they're going to be healed. Because God tells us that he will return unto us the years that the locust hath eaten. He'll give it back now. The hand that hurts is the hand that heals, right? Absolutely. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they were beginning the barley harvest. Don't miss that. They were beginning the barley harvest. So they're getting ready to um, harvest grain. Y'all, it's food time. Walmart was having a buy one, get one sale. It was Black Friday for, uh, you know, several, several weeks. (laughs) You could get whatever. So here's the whole gist of this, y'all. We need to see that the work of God is happening during the darkest times of our life. And I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts here. First of all, do you think that uh, Ruth turned out to be God's ideal woman? Oh, she does. She gets to work. Naomi doesn't have to go and pull the covers off of her and say, Get up! It's time to go to work. Y'all had any youngins you had to do that for? Uh, uh. Or, um, hey Ruth, uh, could you run down to the you know local store I need? Uh Uh-uh, Ruth was already on it. Ruth was a worker. She went out to glean in the fields. And look at the field that God happened to take her to. His name was Boaz. Oh, Boaz. Not knowing that Boaz was one of Naomi's closest relatives. Woohoo! I mean, look at the sovereignty of God. Go ahead. Because we got to finish up. It's 1020. She was a worker. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm Got to work, y'all. Maya Angelou, one of my favorite authors, Maya Angelou, um, wrote all these great things about uh, her life and her struggles. She said, nothing will work unless you do. I say that one often to my students and my own children. (laughs) Nothing will work unless you do. You got to go to work. So here we go. Uh, To end this up, I want you to see four things. First of all, I want you to see God's going to give Ruth a little boy with Boaz. God's going to hook him up. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And that little boy's name is Obed. Obed is the father of a little boy named Jesse. Jesse had six sons, and the youngest one's name was David who becomes the king. Do you know who um, Bible commentators think wrote the book of Ruth? Samuel, the prophet Samuel, the last great judge of the times of the judges. So this is a beautiful, the whole thing's a beautiful picture in all of how it works. So we see God's sovereignty. The second thing is that you see God's mystery in his providence, in his sovereignty. God is mysterious Sometimes his providence is hard. He had dealt bitterly with Naomi, 
But uh, in the short run, it only looked like bitterness, and it lasted only 10 years. Our, our seasons of hard times are short. I know 10 years is a long time. You're saying that's short. Well, now that I'm on this side of my age, yeah, 10 years ain't long at all. <laughs> now, when I was a kid, that was a long time. But look at the mystery of God. At least in the short run, it felt like bitterness, but then when it turned around, that bitterness turned into such joy. And Naomi went from being Mara back to being Naomi again. Because God gave her a little boy. And remember, she had lost two little boys. Asher. Feeling me? <laughs> Sorry. Give her a little boy to replace the son she had lost. Beautiful picture. Beautiful picture. That's what I got out of it, Gil. <laughs> God's good purposes. He's so good to us. When He does things, He does it good. It might look bad and bitter and hard, and you might say, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Because, hey, who's been there done that? I mean, life is hard. And lastly, look at Ruth. Look at the freedom that Ruth got. If we trust the sovereign goodness and mercy of God to pursue you all the days of your life. Where is that verse from? Psalm 23, right? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Y'all can start singing that song if you want to. If God calls, you can leave your family, you can leave your job, you can make radical commitments, you can undertake new adventures. And when you believe in that, that He loves to work mightily for those who trust in Him, we can go anywhere. And that little girl picked up and moved and became such a blessing. She's in the ancestry genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because without a Ruth, there wouldn't have been a David. Without a Limelech, listen to this, sovereignty of God. Without a Limelech, Malon, and Kilion, there would not have been a Ruth. Everybody plays an important part in the orchestra, the symphony. And I was trying to explain this. I was talking to the pastor yesterday. It was just everybody plays such an important part. Everybody has such value in the, the big play that God has, you know, orchestrated for everybody all over the earth. It's an amazing picture of who he is and of who his sovereignty is. So we think about this, and I just want to, Read Romans 15, 4 to you. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Ruth was for us. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. This story gives me hope. Makes me feel good about my own life. And that God's working out everything for His, for my good and for His, what? Glory. Amen. Lord, we thank You for Ruth. We thank You for this awesome picture of your grace and your mercy thank you for letting goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life so we can dwell in your house forever lord we love you and we praise you this day in jesus name amen go conquer the world